the difference between working from life versus a photo. Okay, so if you see any typos, let me know. <laughs> so this is one of my pieces. You guys have seen my work in the beginning, but this kind of breaks down um, some of the process of how these things were created and why it's important to kind of work from life. So this particular piece is, as I mentioned before, um, four feet high and 10 feet long. And it is framed as a triptych. So it's got a seam going down the center, well, not the center, but this side right here. And then another seam going down this side right here. So I framed it in three different acrylic cases. And those acrylic cases, um, think about a box that's put on top of the, the actual drawing. It sits about three inches away from the drawing. And then I worked as an acrylic fabricator. So I was trained how to, you know, um, make these things in terms of framing acrylic wise. But there's a color difference that happens when you work from photograph versus from real life. And so for me personally, learning how to draw from the figure or learning how to draw from still life, I was able to understand um, color theory. Because in, when you're looking at a human, just as an example, if you look at your arm, um, you're going to see, like for me, you could say what we call local color is brown. So if you look at your skin tone, you could say, okay, my local color, which means just my overall color is like a peach or brown or a tan or whatever you want to call your skin tone. I would say mine is just brown, okay? But if I keep looking at my arm, I'm going to see the veins that look green. I'm also going to see some bounce back color from the room that I'm in. So I see purples, I see pinks, I see blues. So I can see that on my actual arm. What happens when you take a photo is the photo actually compresses everything together. Unless you have a really, really high def photo uh, camera like you just saw with the Alexa Mead, most of us don't have that technology. We just use our cell phones or, you know, this is even with an SLR. And I take my photos on three different exposures so I can see shadow masses and light masses. But this is kind of the photo that I worked from to get this particular part of the drawing. And you can see all the color that went behind that. So if you were copying the photo exactly the way you see it, you know, this skin tone here, you would just paint that or draw that, you know? So for me, I had to make sure that I'm putting the pinks, the blues, the greens, the orange. You always want, when you draw skin tone, you always want to have a balance of saturated color, which means rich, vibrant color, like reds and all that, like colors that pop. But you also need neutralizing colors. So you need grays and dull colors like that to neutralize the saturation. Um, so you can see how I'm putting this kind of grayish purple in here. So again, lots of color that goes in there. And then I even go so far as to add like rainbow colors, like literally next to each other. So my transition from my shadow mask to my light mask is done almost with a rainbow effect. It's not really there. Okay, so you learn that as you learn color theory and as you draw from a person, you know, you learn that you can actually put a lot of compliments together or use this kind of technique where you use a gradation of color to um, capture what you want to get in real life. Now, again, for me, I was taught um, when I took an oil painting class, just kind of going back to this piece, I took an oil painting class in college and the teacher was pretty insane. <laughs> I didn't really understand her thought process. Nobody in the class did. And I've never seen her again. So I, I don't know if we got her fired or what, but um, I've never seen her again. But she taught us this method in terms of oil painting. It was a figure drawing class. And um, the thing she taught us was we had to buy white and like this kind of ultramarine blue acrylic paint. And before we could even paint the figure, we had to use white in all the light masses. And we had to use blue in all the shadow masses. And we just thought that was insane. It didn't even make sense to me. Um, and again, as you learn things from me, sometimes what I say may not make sense to you. You may, you may just be doing it, but you don't understand why you're doing it. You know, at the time, I didn't understand why I was doing it. And so I went through the whole semester. We would do the, the white on the light mask, the blue on the shadow mask, and then let that dry and then start the oil painting on top of that. Okay, so after that semester, years later, when I really got into pastel, I started to think about that teacher and I was wondering like, what was her thought process? Why was she having us do that? And when I was doing pastel, I kind of implemented that similar technique. And so what I did here is that I would put blue in all my shadow masses. So you can kind of see that towards the ear where it's really strong, um, also towards the chin where it's not developed yet. Um, but I started putting this kind of ultramarine blue in the shadow mass. And then instead of putting white in the light mass, because with pastel, if you put white, then it's gonna mix together. Um, I just left the paper. And so I would put the, the skin tones on the light mass and then in the shadow mass, put blue first and then the skin tones. And I started thinking about it and I, I just thought this is genius. Like this is years later after I was done with that class. I just thought it was an amazing technique because what she was doing was she was doing a grisaille. And a grisaille is a black and white painting, kind of like an underpainting for you to then paint and glaze color on top. So if you look at the old masters like Caravaggio, Rembrandt, 
you're going to see those paintings that look like they glow. It's like the light masses are super, super rich and strong and the shadow masses, you know, go back. And so you're having this glowing painting. And the way they did that was by painting white in the light mass and they put a gray in the shadow mass so that anything that was over the white would pop out and anything that was over the gray would go back into shadow. So she did a similar thing just with white and blue. Because if you think about what you put in shadow masses, you use cool colors. And so then it clicked and I was like, I'm going to use that in my pastels. And so that's what you're seeing here is that blue shadow mass um, with nothing in the light mass. And that's causing my pastels to pop off the page. So when I teach pastel for my classes, I teach them the same method of putting that blue in the shadow mass and then nothing in the light mass. But kind of the same thing what my teacher taught me before that I did not understand. So, so there's two morals of that story. Sometimes you'll learn something that you don't know why you're doing it. And then like years later, it, you, it just it's like genius to you and you pick it up. And then the other thing is that, you know, you'll have to put additional colors into a photo that are not really there. You have to kind of see beyond the photograph, okay? Here's another one. This is a painting of my husband. It's called Trinity. Uh, it started off as a graphite drawing. So it initially was going to be all pencil and I have photos of it with it being all pencil. And later on, I decided I want this to be a watercolor. And so on top of all the graphite, I painted watercolor. And like I mentioned before, for all these things I'm showing you, I have the progress steps of each one. So if you ever want to see that, I can show you that too. But I had a real big problem with uh, distortion. Okay, so let me show you what I did. This is the photo reference. So this is my husband in the bathroom at the time. And I just put a full, like one of those um, tables behind him to block out all the spots of my uh, shower curtain. But if you see the picture on the left side, that's what the photo actually looks like. When you take a picture of somebody, their feet look like they're levitating off the ground. So if you are not educated in, uh, in this case, how to draw from the figure, and I can only speak from my experience, I'm mainly a figurative artist, that's why I'm talking about that, but it still has to deal with photography. If you're not educated on how to work from that, you're going to notice the perspective kind of goes up at the bottom and you can see that um, towel rod at the, you know, it's kind of coming in like perspective, one point perspective. But you can't draw his feet like that. Because then if you put that on a paper, it's gonna look like he's flying, like floating off the ground. And so what you have to do if you take, if you ever take photos of somebody and you wanna get the proportions correct, you have to take a photo here and then take a photo here and then take a photo here. And you keep going and you piece that all together to create the person. You can't just take one photo. Because if you take one, anything below that is going to obscure and uh, distort. And so this is me laying on the ground, taking this photo of his feet. So the problem I had with this one is I took the image from the left, but I took the feet from the right, and then I ended up with this. So when I look back at this, even though the painting to me is really nice, I don't like to show this piece. This is one of my unsuccessful ones in my mind, only because his legs look too short. My husband's 6'4", and when I look at this, I feel like he's very stumpy. And it's because I, I combined two images together. I combined the one on this side, which makes his feet look longer, with the one on the right side, which makes his you know, legs look shorter by flattening out his feet. So that's a learning lesson for me. So I'll never do that again. You know, try to use one image and then use the other image. You have to kind of plan that ahead of time, but that's what the photo does to you. And if you're not planning for it ahead of time, you fall into what I fell into. So a lot of people, when they see it, they're like, oh, that's a really good painting. I see my mistakes. Just like you see your own mistakes. And sometimes you get hung up on that. So this one is somewhere in my garage. I don't really like to show it. I've shown it a couple of times, but I don't even want to sell it. It's just, I don't, I don't like to show it. And it's because I see the flaw in it. And it's really weird because it's a gorgeous painting, um, but I can't get past the legs. <laughs> okay. So that's just my thing, right? Here's another thing, tilting verticals. So if you take pictures of your still life, like if I say you work from life and you're like, <laughs> I'm just going to take a photo and I'll work from a photo, she'll never know. Yes, I will. I'll totally see it. Okay. You see the, um, the, 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 the um, what am I trying to say? the um, <laughs> distortion <laughs> of that um, actual, those pencil sharpener and then that little bottle, they look like they're leaning. You can actually see the edge of the paper and you can see that white item kind of at an angle. Now this one's not that bad, but sometimes when you take photos, you'll see it like really angling down, especially when you take a photo looking down on it, it'll turn into something like three point perspective where it looks like it's literally narrowing down. So you gotta be careful with that also. Okay? So in terms of your verticals um, angling in. It shows more if you take a picture of like a landscape and you have trees or a hallway of beams like this going down a hall, those beams will start to like curve inwards as they get closer towards the center. So you want to be careful with that too. Here's another one. Um, some people have asked me, what's the largest piece you've ever done? Well, besides a mural, 
this is the largest painting I've ever done. So it's six feet high and this, I'm uh, sorry, five feet high. And then from here to here is six feet. And then from here to here is six feet. So 12 feet long. But it's funny because in this painting, the only thing I like is one part of the painting. And that's this part over here with her hand. If I could cut this painting up into bits and pieces, I would just take this part right here. That's the only part I like about this painting. Why? I don't know. We all do things and we all have our pet peeves, you know. An interesting thing about this piece also, this was our entire graduating master's class. So everyone I graduated and we got our MFA together. This was the first graduating class at Laguna College of Art and Design when they introduced the master's program. And I'm back here. And so these are all my friends that I went to school with. Um, and the painting itself is called Blueprints. And so you can see that she's got this blueprint here. So I'm gonna go to the next photo. This is what she was actually doing. So she was actually holding this book and this is what I painted. But what happens with a photo is that you get overexposure. And sometimes no matter what you do, you can't get the lighting right because of the sun, it's just too strong or it's bouncing off of something. So if you look at her hand, it's very hard to see, you know, the structure in her hand. It's very hard to get the book down, but you can see how I had to fix that exposure problem in my painting over here. And you can also see the colors in her arm. You know, so that's another thing. It's not mentioned in terms of this slide, but you can see how her arm here looks very, I don't know, brownish, um, like a light brownish kind of tannish right here with some blue in it. But look at all the colors that are put into here. You've got blue, you've got brown, you've got green, you've got yellow. And then over here, you see some more. There's pinks over here. So lots of colors add into that as well. Okay. Here's another one called The Messenger. Um, and this is my friend Allison. So we went to school together as well. And I had seen her one day with this beanie on her head. And I said, I need to paint you. She also has a lot of tattoos, and every time I see her, she has more tattoos, and so she's like my muse. And so I said, I need to paint you with that beanie. So I just said, come to this location and wear that beanie. And so we met in LA, and that hummingbird was not there. Okay, so the hummingbird never existed. I wanted to put a hummingbird in there because it has to deal with the theme of this. Um, in terms of messenger, if you look up the symbolism of, of a hummingbird, they're considered messengers. Um, but just having that chain, something being uh, freed or captured, depending on how you look at it. But like I said, the hummingbird was never there. So there's the photo of her on the uh, right side. And there's my reference for the hummingbird. I used about three different hummingbirds to get this image. But using your imagination is huge. You know, so you can see also the hummingbird was repeated in the one with my husband. There were three hummingbirds, so the trinity was there as well. So I use a lot of symbolism. I don't tell people about it, but if you catch it, you catch it. If you know, it's not, you know, whatever. But um, to get the hummingbird there, you also need to cast shadows. You got to use your imagination. And if you just take a photo for its literal reference, you lose a lot of information there. You know, you may want to add something into that photo that's not there. Well, how do you do it? So what I did is I found like five images of hummingbirds because I didn't want to copy any one hummingbird, um, put them kind of all together, change some things. And then I needed to cast shadow. So I figured, hey, my light's coming from the right side. So all I did is I took a piece of paper and I cut out the silhouette of a hummingbird. So this will teach you guys something too, if you ever need to add something. And then what I did is imagine like a cutout of that hummingbird. So it's just a piece of paper cut out in the shape of a hummingbird. I took my phone and I put a light on that paper and cast that shadow against the wall. And so I used that shadow mask that was on the wall to then create this hummingbird that never existed there. So just using your imagination. Um, I think this is the last slide. So just little things that you have to keep in mind um, when you're working from a photograph, you have to consider the, the proportions, the distortions, the color, the exposure, the value, all that will change. And if you're not educated on how to fix those things, you could easily just take the photo for what it is, you know, and then just copy that. So I just wanted to kind of show you that as we get into the still lives later on, you want to make sure if I'm telling you don't work from a photograph, then don't work from a photograph because you need to educate yourself on why you don't need to work from a photograph yet. 